Uh, how did you start out? Did you want to be a teacher or did you want to be a preacher? No, I, uh, I was uh, interested in philosophical problems very early. I remember that when I was eight years old and was lying in my bed before sleeping, I thought about the problem of the infinite. And this grasped me with a tremendous power. And ever since, I thought about philosophical problems. And then I saw the relationship of the philosophical and the theological problems. And in some periods of my life, the theological were stronger and other the philosophical. But in any case, I always remained on the boundary line between philosophy and theology. I do remember that your father himself was a minister, isn't that true? Yes, he was a minister in a little town or kind of bishop in a little town in eastern Germany. Very nice old town, all around walls from the 16th or 15th century. Still very well preserved, and we used to walk around them, and of course we boys went upon them and walked <laughs> along there. And this gave me a feeling of the past, of history, of something which you cannot find so easily in this country where the oldest cities like East Hampton start in 1648 or something like that. Are those apples from East Hampton? No, unfortunately not. They are very good apples, even if they are not from East Hampton. Why don't you take one? Thank you. Of course, I know you were very active politically back in Germany. Yes, if you call it politically. You see, it was not really a political party to which I belonged or with which I worked. But it was an attempt to solve the social problems and the political problems of the post-First World War Germany in terms of the theological and religious principles. And this produced a movement, and uh, a very strong one, but not strong enough to resist the growing Nazism and growing Hitlerism. So when Hitler came, you know what happened. You had to leave. No, that happened in a very dramatic and nice way. The list of those professors who were first dismissed was published in the American press. After this, the Nazis didn't publish it anymore. But I was on the first list, which was still published. And immediately when Professor Niebuhr of Union Seminary and Professor Fries of Columbia heard about it, who knew my work, uh, came to Germany and asked me to come. And I came. And out of this trip came your 15 years stay in this country. And uh, now 22 years. Oh, 22, in this, that's right. 22 yeah. years in this country, yes, and 22 very great years in my life. By the way, I always meant to ask you, uh, did you find a great deal of difference in the way of teaching over in the continent and uh, here? The American students don't feel that they are one point in a long stream of events going back thousands and thousands of years. While the European students, when they have a problem, immediately think, what did former people say about this problem? What did they think about it? I myself am unable to deal with any present-day problem without going back. My mind does that automatically to the past and asking myself, well, what did the uh, former people say about the same thing? So the Americans have the feeling they start something new. And the Europeans, they continue something old. A while ago, uh, you uh, spoke about the the change of problems uh, over in Europe and here, uh, the change from the psychological to the uh, from the political to the psychological. 
uh, could you uh, tell me about how this developed in the last ten years? Yes, uh, that's a very interesting uh, development which I experienced. When I came to this country, Europe was full of anxiety, feeling of meaninglessness, and all this exploded finally in the Hitler Revolution and in Communism and in the Second World War. When I came to this country, very little of this was noticeable. You simply couldn't find much of it. I, of course, gave in my lectures some of the material I had learned and studied and researched in Europe. But in the first years, there was very little uh, reply to all this. They, they couldn't really find what I was talking about because they hadn't experienced these things. Now slowly, the situation changed. In the later 30s, in the Second World War, and especially during the Cold War, after the Second World War, something of that anxiety which uh, we had in Europe before became visible also in this country. And I noticed it very much in my lectures and sermons in the colleges and universities. And whenever I spoke in the last, especially last five years, about the different forms of anxiety and so on, then there was a tremendous response in, in, in all these younger people and in many of the older too, but especially in the younger people. So that I finally decided to give some foundation lectures in Yale University, the so-called Terry Lectures, under the heading of what later became my book, The Courage to Be. This simply means I wanted to give an answer to the growing anxiety which developed also in this country. The answer was courage. But a very special kind of courage, of course, which I tried to develop there, not the courage of the soldier, but the courage of the human being who feels all the riddles and all the meaninglessness of life and who nevertheless is able to say yes to life. Uh, do you think you could uh, tell me uh, what caused this kind of change? Now there are many answers to this. Of course, one answer is, as always, disappointment. Mm -hmm. There was a tremendous amount of disappointment that the First World War didn't make the world happy or mature for democracy, as the slogan was. Then, the years before the First World War, were full of anxiety about the Hitler situation, the communist situation. Then, the American younger generation went into the Second World War and came out of it, and the world looked darker than before in this East-West split. As I sometimes say, the whole world was schizophrenic, which is a kind of mental disease in individuals, and I had the feeling mankind as a whole had this disease. And, uh, were you uh, greatly influenced by uh, the uh, literature of today in which this is reflected? I mean, uh, the most obvious and ardent age of anxiety kind of uh, uh, lends itself. Uh, uh, yes, and, and Eliot's wasteland. Now, I was not so much influenced by them, but I was confirmed by them. My real period in which I was mostly influenced was when I read first Kierkegaard 50 years ago, then when I read Dostoevsky, the great Russian novelist, then when I was a colleague of Heidegger, the philosopher, and met Jaspers and the other existentialists, then a little bit later, I was deeply impressed by the novels of Kafka. Uh, when we met last, you were working very uh, closely uh, in another field of art, and uh, much more individual arts, in uh, painting, and tried to relate that to theological thought. Uh, 
I wonder what you did in the meantime to follow up that trend of thought. Now, I had to give, uh, perhaps you heard about it, several lectures about religion and art, yes. one in the National Gallery in Washington and on some other places. And I like this very much and have to speak about it during the next month several times. Now, I will show you why I do this. For instance, when I give a lecture on Renaissance, on that period, then I can speak about the philosophical principles of the Renaissance. I can say, for instance, that in the Renaissance, nature becomes visible and man goes into the center instead of God. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say such a thing, I think it's very useful for myself and for my students to look at such a picture as, for instance, here by Hieronymus Bosch, one of the first who opens up nature, makes nature more than only a background. Nature is something independent here, as it became in the whole Renaissance. And when we today boast in our natural science, it has something to do with such a picture, mm -hmm. namely the opening up of nature. Now that's the one thing in it. Then obviously men, namely John on Patmos, writing the visions about the end of the world, is in the center. And the interesting thing are the two diagonals. The one starting with the divine, represented by Mary in the sun. And then the angels. And then men. And then here, on the right side, the demonic world. And then the other diagonal coming from there, having a wonderful tree going through man to the animal, to this little bird here. So we have the whole universe connected, centered in man, and especially in the human face, which means in the Renaissance philosophy, man's rational power. Now well, that's one example. Now that's all very well and uh, uh, much more representative. Now if you take a modern piece like uh, uh, Picasso's Guernica here, uh, it would be much more difficult to give an analysis like that because nothing is so obvious in the foreground. Wouldn't you think so? Oh, I would think very much so. And I would say if you have to compare this with something I said before, it's this Kafka. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with respect to anxiety. Now, look at the different faces of men and animals here. They are full of anxiety about the terrible catastrophe which came over this little Spanish town before the Second World War, when the Nazis and the Fascists bombed it. Now, this is uh, Guernica, the little town which was destroyed. Now what he does here is not to describe scenes which every photographer could take, but to express the mood of the people and express it in terms of this shock and this tremendous anxiety which is produced by the end of the world, which it really was for the inhabitants of this little town. Now this is characteristical not only for Picasso, but for all modern art. They don't want to describe the surface of the world in the same way in which uh, former art, even this Renaissance art, does. But uh, they want to show that our world is in pieces, is disrupted. And therefore, sometimes in my lectures when I am asked, tell me, a truly Protestant picture of today, which is painted today. When I say go to Picasso's Guernica picture, because there you see the world in pieces. And that's the one side which Protestantism always emphasizes and must emphasize. It's not the whole of Protestantism, mm -hmm. but it's the one side. And what is nearest to our present mind is just this side. If we relate uh, theology to art this way, uh, what does it do to the usual way uh, theology is defined? Uh, 
Now, what do you mean with the usual way? It's very hard to say what the usual way is, but you have something in mind, certainly. Uh, uh, I would think uh, a definition of doctrine uh, or a presentation of the Christian faith. Yes, now that's, uh, these two things are often used. I agree with you. But each of them is terribly difficult. And you know, I have another definition, and I will repeat it now, since you asked me that question. Uh, I believe faith, that word, should be defined as the state of being ultimately concerned. Now, this is like a stumbling block for some people. They will be shocked by it. Certainly, I know they are. But I insist on it because I believe it's perhaps the best way of understanding the reality and the seriousness of religion and of faith. Now, ultimately concerned means man has many concerns. Artistic concerns, daily life concerns, food and clothes and concern about friends, about women, about everything, and men, marriage, and children, and everything. But there is one concern I believe every human being has, namely the concern about what his life as a whole does mean. And that's what I call ultimate concern. Every phase expresses itself in some ideas, in some actions, or as I would call them, in some symbols. Symbols are expressions of faith, whether it's success, or whether it's the nation, or whether it's one human being, which is your ultimate concern, or whether it's some being, which is called God. In any case, they are symbols of our ultimate concern, they express it. And now I come to the task of theology, and that's my whole life's work of which I am speaking now. Namely, theology has to show what these symbols mean, what kind of faith is behind them, not only of behind the Christian symbols, but also symbols like nation or success or progress or science. They all can become symbols of an ultimate concern. The function of the theologian then is to investigate into the symbols. Yes, certainly. That's what I always have said and defended. Now, the question is how to do it and what to do with these symbols. You can say they all are something which must be removed. And there are important theologians today who want to remove all symbols. I don't believe they are right. There is no religion without symbols. And there is no any faith without a symbolic expression. So we must not remove them. On the other hand, we cannot take them simply literally and speak of them as if it were a story which happens here in our room. But it's something which expresses and points to something else, namely to our ultimate concern. Now this leads me, has led me always, or for a long time, to the following method. I ask first the human questions. For instance, as we did uh, uh, shortly before, the question of anxiety or the question of guilt, the question of doubt, of meaninglessness, all these human questions. And then I try to show how these human questions are answered by the religious symbols. For instance, as Christian theologian, I would say by the Christian symbols, God, the Christ, and the others. Now this I call the method of correlation. Here the human questions, here the religious symbols. And to understand these symbols, you must relate them to the human questions. Otherwise they are un 
understandable. I often say to ministers and theologians, don't throw stones at the heads of people, but try to make understandable to them what you say. If you throw your dogmas and doctrines like stones at them, they will turn away. They cannot take them. But if you make understandable what these symbols mean, then they will see suddenly, this is not all nonsense, that's not all unbelievable uh, uh, tradition, but that's something which concerns them directly. Now that's what I mean with the method of correlation. Would you think that this is particularly a Protestant way of approaching it? Yes, now uh, that brings us to another point, a very important point too. You see, usually, uh, and in some church traditions, the religious symbols and the doctrinal form in which they are given in instruction of children and in preaching and everywhere, are supposed to be the immovable divine revelation, which simply has to be taken as it is. This, of course, is mostly expressed in the Roman Catholic Church, where we have statements which are called by faith, which everybody has to accept, and where no theologian is allowed to deviate or to change what is given in the official doctrine of the Church. Now, as a Protestant theologian, I cannot accept that method. I have a very high valuation of the tradition. As you know, some people call me much too conservative. But nevertheless, I never would feel to be bound to them in such a way that I simply have to repeat them and to accept them as eternal truths. They are human expressions of the eternal, but they are not eternal themselves. And that's what I call the Protestant principle. Nothing what human beings do, not even the Protestant churches do, not even the Bible does, is in itself eternal. Eternal, I would say as a theologian, is God alone. And in the moment in which his revelation comes into human minds and hearts and hands, it is changed in a human way and it cannot be taken as a final and ultimate form. Uh, there is a continuous change of expression of some symbols and of uh, theological inquiry into the meaning of these symbols. Now that's my Protestant point of view. So I feel free in my inquiries into the meaning of the Christian symbols to deal with the tradition of all churches, including the Protestant churches, in a way which is determined by the ultimate concern of Christianity on the one hand, and by the needs of the human beings today on the other hand. This, of course, makes you much freer in relationship to the other sciences. Certainly. You see, if you define faith as uh, belief in something more or less believable, then you are continuously in conflict with history, with natural science, with psychology, with everything. Mm -hmm. In the moment in which you say that faith is being ultimately concerned and that the religious expressions are symbols, then there is no interference of science with religion and of religion with science. They are in two different dimensions. Science is in the dimension of describing this reality in all its relations to each other. Religion points to the dimension of the ultimate. And in this way, there is no possible conflict if this is seen in a clear way. I think this is one of the greatest advantages of the method of correlation and the Protestant principle. All right, uh, the method of correlation uh, gives the analysis of the human situation, but what about the Christian answer? Now, as I, as I believe you know, answers are always more difficult than questions. 
But I will try to give you a kind of summary of what I think in terms of my method of correlation and my Protestant principle about the Christian symbols. Now, I believe that Christianity has made it very clear that the human situation is a situation of estrangement of man from himself, from what he should be and essentially is. Therefore, the answer only could be, how can this estrangement be overcome? And the way in which it can be overcome is, as I would say, the appearance of a new reality, of a reality in which these splits and estrangements, these anxieties and guilt feelings are overcome. I call this uh, the new being which means a new reality, a new state of things, not the state of estrangement and of anxiety, but as I would like to call it, the state of a courageous affirmation of our life in spite of all the shortcomings and estrangements. And in this way, I make this word the new being, the center of my theology, and as a Christian theologian, I believe that this new being is most visible and centrally visible in the picture of Jesus as the Christ in the New Testament. But uh, that answer needs again much more explanation, and very soon we will be in the lecture and I will speak just about this point.